Welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you here on Seeing Through a Pandemic, a conversation with Gregory Spade and Dr. Jody Kovach. To introduce Greg Spade, we have our summer associate, Rebecca Utian. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. My name is Rebecca Utian, as Sydney said, and I am a Kenyan college student and a proud Gun Gallery associate. I had the pleasure of working with Professor Spade during 2019 and 2020 over the course of the planning and curation of the Art of Trees exhibition. During this time, I and my fellow curatorial leaders had the opportunity to speak with Professor Spade in his studio. I can clearly remember paging through one of his many sleeved folders, each full of a carefully preserved leaf with the specific location and date on which he found it. From this experience, I realized that Professor Spade work, in my opinion, exists in the junction between art and science. To me, this converging of natural beauty, creative spontaneity, and his meticulous archival process is what makes his work so compelling. In conjunction with his most recent exhibition in the Gun Gallery, Professor Spade produced a series of videos which he shared with friends, faculties, and students alike. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, I, and I believe many others, found these videos to be a source of comfort. To me, they served as a reminders of the beauty and intricacies of the natural world that exists right outside my very doorstep. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gregory Spade. Thank you everyone for being here. This is really exciting to see such a large audience, especially in July. I don't think we've ever had a public event like this in July, but I had a feeling that Greg would draw a very large crowd. So <laughs> um, thank you so much for being willing to do this and to share your videos with everyone as you have throughout the year, but also in this format. So this is supposed to be a conversation, not just between Greg and me, but with everyone. So all of us here are invited to um, contribute with comments, questions. We're going to watch a couple of these videos to start out, just to kind of get us warmed up. And then we'll just open the floor to uh, you know, a conversation. And I'm, I have plenty of questions. I've been watching these videos as they come through uh, for, throughout the year. And for me, as just as Rebecca mentioned, they've been a real source of inspiration, of peace, contemplation. Um, one thing I especially love about Greg's work is that it is beautiful. Uh, he really has a, a sensitivity for um, the a aesthetics of nature and uh, reminds me that art and nature are redemptive and restorative and really make us human. It's an essential part of being human. So I thank you so much for sharing that with us. And before we get started on showing the videos, I'd like to turn it over to Greg. He has a few comments. It's working, right? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much um, for being here. And for those of you that have been following my uh, videos over now, I guess, close to six months, um, I've really appreciated having an audience. <laughs> Artists need audiences. And it felt like I had an audience and through the pandemic, and that was very special to me. Um, but I also want to acknowledge something else. And well, first of all, it's that I have not been in a room like this with this many people for a year and a half. Um, and I find that at every point um, where I begin to sort of venture out into the world, my family and I went to, we went to a restaurant um, in Columbus on Sunday. And that was the first time. But one of, the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, we have been through something. Um, We've been through something enormously significant and sad um, and challenging for all of us. And it wasn't just the pandemic. Um, 
it was the layers of crisis on top of crisis um, that we were gone, going through. You all know what they were. But never in my lifetime, you know, have I been through anything like that. And part of me wants to leave it behind, but the other part of me wants to not forget it. And in fact, more than that, to be a different person um, afterward, or to have a different society, a better society, um, after what we have done. And it isn't just us, it's the whole world. And I know that when I was teaching, um, and we had to go online, um, Catherine Franco was in, no, you weren't in one of those classes, Catherine, no. Um, but Judy Adams was in one of those classes. Lucy Adams was in one of those classes. She's here. Um, and when that happened, I think one of the things that um, was clear, as everybody was had to go home and lock down, many people from New York who really had to lock down in the city, was that, you know, this was huge what was happening. But we were sharing it with the world. It isn't just us. It isn't just our country. It was everywhere. And it's not over yet. Obviously not over yet. Um, and I don't mean just the pandemic. I mean all the layers of crisis that we have been through. But I do have a positive thing to add to this. Um, I learned a word or term the other day in an essay that I read by a sociologist named Adam Grant. And it was collective effervescence. Um, maybe some of the rest of you have, have know that term or read that article, but it was new to me, that idea. But he said that something happens when there's a gathering of people, and it can be people that are at work together, working on some problem. If there's a particular shared goal in mind, that there can be this that happens. And the same thing can be true going to a concert or being in an athletic event. That when people gather together, <clears throat> this is always the potential, this collective effervescence. And it's one of the reasons why we were sad during the pandemic that we didn't have that. So my hope for this next hour <laughs> is that that collective effervescence will happen. And I don't know how we'll know, but I suspect it'll be little bubbles coming up from the floor. <laughs> so thank you for being here.
Um, so I have a lot of questions for you, but I don't want to uh, dominate the conversation. So I'd like to open it up to the audience first and just ask if any of you have any comments or questions or thoughts you'd like to bring up. Lucy. I guess I do need this. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we were supposed to repeat the questions, aren't we? Yes. Um, so this is how I did the, um, the process of doing this change over time from the beginning. Um, and that's a really good question um, because it's sort of top of my mind right now, really essentially where do I go from here? Um, I think that I've sent out now uh, 30 and roughly one a week. Um, and also there's two new ones that you're gonna see coming up. Um, and you're absolutely right, Lucy, that at the t th these started, I sent the first ones out on January the 1st. See if you can project yourself back to that change of the year, January the 1st. Um, what a time it was, incredible. Um, and that was the first. Um, actually, I started making uh, videos, and these are all done on my phone. Um, so I started making videos on July the, f the 4th, the 4th of July. It's not that I'm that patriotic, but um, that happened to be when they were made. So it took me that period of time from July to uh, January the 1st, to be able to really learn what I had to do, learn the, pro the, the editing program for the videos and get a sense of what was going on. They all started out as, as um, still photographs in my phone. Um, and it was actually people like Lucy, who was taking my class when it all went digital because everybody had to go home. Lucy went to Oregon. Um, many of those students of mine were using their phones to do the work of the class. And I was so impressed <laughs> with what they did. And so I said I had to do, I had to try it. And uh, so at first it was still photography, then it was video. Um, but actually right now, um, I guess we're about six months for me, six months into sending them out to people. I'm beginning to think like, how long does it last? Um, how much further should I go with this? And I probably have at least another 20 videos that are there setting for just the finishing touches. So it could go on for some time. But I'm beginning to sense that it definitely is a new moment now. And so the reason that I like Lucy's question so much is that um, I think this was a project for the moment we all just lived through. And that's not over. So that could be an argument for me not stopping soon. Um, but for me, it was very important, I think, to find a way to reach out to people. And I think that the, the quality, it's not exactly the right term, the tone of the work was meant to be something that was going to sort of, you know, raise our consciousness to um, lift the human spirit in some way. And I believe that art can do that. Not all art does, but art can do that, and it's an important use of art. Um, so maybe we're, I'm only at the midpoint in this. It might go on another six months, but I don't know. Thank you for the question. So it gave me a bit more motivation and, and inspiration to 
view things slightly differently. Um, on that, because it affected me as, a, as an observer of you, the maker, I'm wondering if there was any moments you've had while out in the field where you ran into some people or had some maybe some conversations that played into a bit of that collective effervescence, even if it wasn't a mass of people, or maybe it was the reception of the videos themselves, um, and if, if that like influenced the process Ooh, that's a complicated question to summarize. Um, so L Luke ran into me at the BFECT, and that's the Environmental Center. I have to be aware of the fact that this is being taped and could be heard by somebody that doesn't know anything about Canyon. Um, so we were at the Environmental Center, um, and I didn't realize you had seen me there working so many times. Um, but I was there a lot, and also a lot of other places in and on my long walks um, around Gambier. Um, as to whether there was any kind of inter important interaction to me when I was there doing that, I guess I have two thoughts about that. One is probably not, because it was a pandemic, and I was avoiding people. <laughs> Uh, literally avoiding people. I would, you know, take another route or something if I saw somebody on the path at that time. Um, and, um, well, I, I guess that, that that's, oh, I guess the other is that where I did feel, I've already said this, where I did feel a connection to all of you was in sending these out to you, in having an audience, and um, I also got some really wonderful and helpful responses. And those of you in the sciences helped me with the science involved here. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm really thankful for that. By the way, when you, this doesn't have to be just questions. Please, if you have a, just a comment, make a comment. These are such complicated questions. <laughs> I thought I'd be qu getting questions like, well, what time in the morning did you go up, get up? To <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, oh. Catherine, how, let's see, how can I? Um, so she says that one of the things that I emphasized in my teaching was sort of the, I think, being the ineffable, ineffable um, qualities of a work of art. I really, things that you can't even explain. Um, and did I have those kind of experiences, she asks, when I'm out there um, making these? And absolutely I did. Um, and and the, the closest I can come to like describing the sort of sense I would be in, this is why I didn't see Luke, <laughs> um, is that it was like a secular prayer that I was having um, as I was looking at kind of the wonder, looking closely, you know, at things in nature, or watching the patterns um, on water, for instance. Um, so, I mean, I would hold my, I would find myself holding my breath um, at what was actually happening as I was recording it. And I couldn't go for three minutes, but actually probably the longest any of the clips are that I shot were about a minute and 20 seconds and sometimes I felt like I held my breath because at the end of it I would just you know gasp um, and so yes I mean I, if I had just done this and you know not sent it out to anyone it still would have been an important moment for me I think to help 
get me through the pandemic and everything else, all the crisis. Thank you. Oh, John. Um, one question, practical. How many uh, times did it take to train that swallow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, related, uh, a practical matter is that uh, obviously you went out, and I'm old enough to remember before the advent of popularization of digital cameras where you film was very expensive and capturing a moment was you spent the whole day perhaps out you know, doing something like that. So my question comes down to you went out on these walks and I find with digital photography a lot of it is filtering, winnowing through. Um, and so the work that goes behind what we're seeing here, how many shots, how, how much wound up on the cutting floor for everything we see here? I mean, I'm just curious about um, the process goes that goes yeah, so a little bit about the process. He's asking, um, you know, how do they come together? How much do I kind of throw away? Um, and, yeah, so I, one answer to that is that, yeah, it's just sort of my habit as a photographer, as a still photographer, um, that I make a tremendous number of pictures, far too many, um, because then I have to sit in front of a computer screen and edit them for digital. And actually, that's the part I, I like the least. Although digital editing is different. It's like listening to music. Um, and I mean, video editing is different. Um, so um, one thing I can say about that, I think, is that I began to sort of develop certain kinds of pet words I would use for the type of video that I was making. And one of them that I liked the best was where it was just one take. Um, and I, th this one that we just saw, the Kokosing River, was actually one take. Um, but it was complicated by the fact that I had a, like a freeze frame to begin with and a freeze frame at the end. And that's why it sort of both sort of, you know, passes from the frozen you know, into the movement and then freezes again at the end. Um, and so, I'm very aware of the fact that I want there to be form <laughs> and that I'm dealing with sort of formal issues um, in making these. Um, but if the, these are not movies in the typical sense, although I think there is a little bit of an arc. You know, if the Godfather's arc was like this, you know, then the arc of these is like that. It's like almost nothing, but there does have to be, in my mind, some kind of development that takes place. And sometimes I get that. Um, it's just there by accident, or by the grace of nature, it's there. Um, and I don't have to do t very much to it. But sometimes I really do have to construct what's happening in order to get the feeling that something is developing over that short period of time. I didn't want to keep you from asking questions. <laughs> Dan.
So Dan's question has to do with like how I was able to get things with a phone, you know, to take the photographs. How could they be so still? Um, and yeah, well, when I was in art school, I took that course. It's called Stillness. And we had to go into the room and, and learn how not to move for 50 minutes. <laughs> and finally it paid off. <laughs> No, Dan, actually, um, I do use a tripod, and, you know, it really helps. I, I would not be able to do these things where you feel like um, nature is kind of developing before you, or the leaves are doing a kind of dance or something. Um, and I wouldn't be able to be that steady. Occasionally, like, there was no tripod for what I call walk number one. That was the field swallow. Um, occasionally I can do it, but it has to be a much more kind of a dynamic subject. But actually I love what happens when the camera is it's just, when the, it's just there. It's just perfectly still and it's observing. So yes, and the camera, I'm, I'm really lucky because I just happen to have, from doing photographs in New York, um, a very, very light tripod, incredibly light, actually, for as good as it is. So I can go, when I go out, I can be out for three hours, sometimes probably longer, and just walking around with very little equipment, you know, the, the phone on the end of a tripod, uh, a mic that is designed to be on the phone so that I, it's a directional mic instead of the omnidirectional sound that you typically get with a, with a phone. Um, but there isn't any magic to it beyond that. I envisioned you having your foot on the ledge of the bridge down at the uh, river for the first week. Oh, you've caught me. Were you walking by? <laughs> you've, ca you've caught me out on another. Actually, that one that we just saw, there was no tripod. Um, and I did exactly that. Um, I, I used the trestle to stabilize the phone. Um, and just to give you another you know, glimpse into what was going on there, actually, there was a lot more sound. We gotta get the sound up if we can, because the sound matters. I spent a lot of time thinking about the sound. Um, but anyway, the, what happened there was, we had had one of those incredible snows. We had a couple of amazing snows um, in the middle of winter. And they were those snows where the snow just stays on the branches. But it was beginning to thaw. And I was watching the snow fall into the river um, off of the boughs. And I thought, oh, this is fascinating because there was the current of the river, but then there was a sort of whole new current that was established by the splash. And one of those splashes occurred in that video. I don't know whether you saw it well. Um, so that was sort of the impetus for me to you know, try to find a way that I could stabilize my phone in order to take that photograph. Um, the other thing I would say is that so much of this is accident, and I love that. I mean, that's, I've done a lot of what photographers call street photography, I'm still working on a project on the streets of New York, um, now called Pedestrians, um, where you just sort of take what comes. And you have to be ready, um, be receptive. Um, you have to anticipate a lot. And so that applies here too very much. But the other thing that happened to me, sorry for these long answers, but the other, the other thing that happened was that sound made it all different. Um, and at first I was very upset by how loud the Kenyon College campus is. Um, and how loud the highways are around us. All of that sound was getting into my videos. And then about the same time, I read uh, this book, um, which is The Machine in the Garden by Leo Marx, 1964. And it sort of changed the way I started thinking about these machines that were making all of this sound around me. And so in that video that you just saw of the river, the bow falls into the Kokosing River. I mean, the snow falls into the Kokosing. You know, then there's this fairly large ripple effect. 
At that time, a truck goes by on the highway, and that's the sound you hear. It almost feels in the video, I think, like it's a sound effect or something that I put in there, you know, to sort of match the intensity of the ripple. But it was, you know, purely fortuitous that all that came together at the same time. This is the most complicated question, but I'm not going to be able to get through all of this. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right that, you know, you might think that I'm saying the machine is that truck going down the highway that's spoiling my video. But my phone is the machine. It always is, you know. But I got some of this concept. In fact, I learned about the book, The Machine in the Garden, from E.O. Wilson. Biophilia, his book. And he talks about this concept that comes from The Machine in the Garden, the book, but he goes further. And he said, you know, it's also us. We're the machine in the garden. It's our brains. It's the way we think, the way we categorize things. And that means that there isn't, you know, a, a nice convenient enemy out there um, that we can get angry at, that we're part of the problem. Um, my camera's part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. When I sit down, you know, at my computer, I have to be aware that the power that, you know, the electrical power that is coming through is from coal, built, dug in, in central Ohio, probably, and at Conesville. Jody spent time, your father worked at Conesville, right? Um, the plant that produces our power. I think it, our power still comes from there. Um, so we're, we're all implicated in this. And how do we fix it? How do we get beyond it, you know, to do a better job, to be better stewards of the earth? I'm not sure I know. Do you know, Ren? for example, or may have a community garden. And what if we extended the garden concept to other, to other aspects of garden that actually encompass more of the experience that all of us are having during the pandemic? Yeah, that would be a wonderful thing if we could do that, if we could bring more of the natural world into sort of all parts of a city. Um, there was something, I guess, about a week, 10 days ago or so, about the tree canopy in parts of New York. And now that you know, there's all the sophisticated ability to be able to do data with maps and whatnot, it became incredibly clear throughout the entire, maybe you all read this, in, throughout the entire country, United States, that the amount of trees on a street in a city was directly related to the wealth of the people that live there. 
And it's the poor neighborhoods that don't have that vegetation. And people know now, scientists know, that trees have a healing quality uh, about them, not just psychologically, but they improve conditions of asthma and things like that. Um, and so the fact that we have this incredible breach, you know, between what happens in a wealthy area of any city, they have Col Columbus is in the article, and what happens in a wealthy city. Um, it reminds me of something that is in the, this is an art historian, John Berger, Berger, um, his book, Ways of Seeing, where he talks about advertising. And the people that are generating the billboard advertising, the kind of things that we plaster all over our cities, don't live in those neighborhoods. Their neighborhoods don't have that outdoor advertising. Um, so these issues get to issues of justice. And so this is <laughs> that's my cue. Um, a book that's been very important to me is um, Elaine Scarry's um, On Beauty and Being Just. And it comp uh, like everything else, it complicates where we are, but I think it's very easy to think that justice is one thing, beauty is something else. But actually she tries to make the argument that in many ways the two are very related to each other. Um, and then the way we think about justice, for instance, we use some of the same words like fair, you know, is it a fair society? that we live in. But we also do use those words to describe like a beautiful day. It was a fair day at the beach. Um, and the case that Elaine Scarry, she's a sort of a philosopher. She works in philosophy. She writes in uh, literary criticism and aesthetics. The case that she makes is that beauty makes us more capable of being able to work for a world that is just. That, that it motivates an impulse toward justice. Um, and I think that's true. It's not just mere beauty. And I'm talking about beauty, not glamour. Glamour is something you sell. Um, but I think that's true. In my experience, I guess I would say that's true of beauty. I hope so. Thank you, Greg. I, I think that um, with all of these comments and questions that a lot of, um, I've been thinking about the videos again, and I thought that now might be a good time to show another one. And perhaps one of the videos that um, were sound seems to be a really significant element. I, I know sound is in, in all of them, but um, I'm wondering if you have one in mind in our queue that sure. might be In the field swallow one, the sound is, I think, really important in that. Um, and part of it is that they, these swallows that were attacking me, basically, or trying to, they were, they were defending their, their young, um, the nest that was nearby. But they make this mechanical clicking sh sound. And um, I don't know whether you heard that in, in this or not. You did. Back there, Joe, you can hear it. Well, oh, great. Um, so, anyway, no, I don't know that I could think of one in particular for, let me look, for sound. Oh, well, we might do, um, ironweed. Okay.
Robin Wall Kimmerer um, came to Kenyon and gave a lecture. It's probably about four years ago or something. I love a lot of things about that one. <laughs> it's it's really different from the others, in part because there are actors, so to speak. Um, but I'm curious, most of all, about how you chose to frame this. Were the cows, at least the way they entered the frame, unexpected? Did you did they come because they were curious about what you were doing? Were you intending to just focus on the ironweed and something else happened? I, I think that this might tell us a lot about your working process overall and how much is um, sort of planned and how much is serendipitous. Um, yeah, you've got you've got it, uh, Jody. It was just about the ironweed. <laughs> I set up my tripod, you know, there was actually a fence down sort of below my view. You probably can even guess where this was at the, at the environmental center. Um, Luke was probably walking behind me. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know. Um, and I was just concentrating on this beautiful color combination of that kind of magenta of the flower and the green behind. Um, and the first beast came up. Um, and it was unexpected. It wasn't that I didn't see them. You know, I knew they were out there. But he didn't know it was going to pay me this visit and come right up to the plant. And I also didn't know whether it was going to start eating the plant. But now I've learned that ironweed is poisonous, is that right, to, to cattle, you know, to a lot of things. Um, yeah, so um, the fact that it's divided into three parts, this is one of the ones, John, this is one of the ones where I suppose there was more editing involved than most. Um, I've, I don't know why, but I, I think that in this one, if I remember right, the camera was just running for a long period of time. And the cows were sort of a herd of cows that were passing. And then some of them, you know, they did different things. So eventually I had the sense that it was enough, there was enough drama in the various things that they did that I should divide it and play with the idea of that three-part structure. And I'd really like to do that again to find other, but it's serendipity, Jody. It, I mean, it was total serendipity. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, it's about collecting, and um, Rebecca has noticed that it, that's something I do in my in my work. I have a series upstairs in the gallery, or some some represented up there, the leaf cutting series, where I collect leaves to make them, as she referred to in the introduction. Um, so, how much before doing any of this was I still aware of the fact that my work was about collecting? Is the question, um, and I actually have quite consciously thought that not only me, but what photographers do often is make collections. And part of it is that after working a while, you just don't go out and photograph anything. Um, in fact, I'm not a photographer that carries a camera around with me because it's not like I think I'm gonna see something and I should photograph that. Um, so eventually it becomes more of a project. And so an example of this is this work that I'm doing in 
um, New York, which is called Pedestrians, where um, I was I was influenced by uh, Jane Jacobs' book. The um, get this mixed up, but I think it's the death or this the life and death of the American city, of the great American city, life and death of the great American city. She's the person in New York that was very much behind the preservation movement. Um, but she coined a term which was the sidewalk ballet, and I was fascinated by that concept when I first started photographing in New York. And eventually I sort of found what I called perches. Some of you have seen this work. I found perches where I would photograph sort of down on the sidewalk, and then I would wait for whatever happened um, and try to do, make the best of it. They end up being looking a little bit like abstract portraits or something of people on the street. But I was very aware that I was like collecting and I was trying to collect different types. I was trying to collect different modes of dress. Um, yeah, so I think collecting is a good analogy to what I think I'm doing. About back to Ren's question again and yours about mentioning the machine in the garden. Um, so in Leo Marx's book and Peter is very aware of this. He taught, he taught this book in American Studies. This is a kind of interdisciplinary book that would be perfect. And it is about America, um, American literature, actually. Um, and what Marx does is try to explain how sort of deep in our founding, there are these myths that come through in narratives about th this country, the new world, you know, be, being a garden, or being pastoral, being Edenic, um, and that that has been with us, that idea that I mean, even after we did whatever we did to the East Coast, we kept thinking, well, the West is still, you know, this paradise waiting for us out there. So that comes up, a really good example that Peter just mentioned to me is, what Marx does was that he traces this through particularly particularly important works of American literature. Um, but in Huckleberry Finn, um, there's this scene after Jim and Huck are on the raft, and they're floating down the Mississippi. They're coming closer and closer to the slave states. Um, and there's implications in that. Who knows whether Huck really fully understands what must be in Jim's mind. But they're floating down the river and they have this kind of idyllic moment where it just feels right. It's quiet, it's night, it's foggy. Um, they feel like they're together in some way. And out of the fog appears a steamboat that runs them over, runs over the raft. And so Marx um, comes up with several examples of that in American literature. Um, Thoreau sitting outside his cabin on Walden Pond, sitting there, and a steam engine passes behind him, you know, making a huge amount of noise, casting its shadow you know, on the pond. Um, so he uses this as a dialectic to help explain sort of the American narrative. Um, and I think it's still with us. Um, we still have this tension in our lives, but for this desire for beauty, desire for paradise, for a pastoral, beautiful pastoral environment in which to live. Um, but we also are so dependent upon the machines that are tearing the paradise apart. Um, I don't know how we resolve that. Fred. Fred asked about garden versus nature. Yeah. I just want to give you my response to what I thought was the case. Garden is not nature. Garden is tending. Adam and Eve, that's paradise. Pardes means garden. It has to be tended by human beings. And what I thought you were doing, and I love, and it goes to E.O. Wilson's point, we are the machine. When you look at something and choose what to look at and how to do it, you're gardening. You're taking nature and making it formal in some way. And 
that's what I thought you were doing. You were making a garden of nature, and I love that. So, oh, but I think it's an interesting idea, and, um, and maybe that is what, what's happening. Um, but then there's that one piece that you just recently sent us um, of the, let's see, first sun on the red maple. I'm sure I'm getting the title right. Is this the one with? The Lewis Hyde quote. Um, that was it's black and it's in black and white. It's in black and white. Yeah. yeah. That one was, was to me was more about the statement of the power of nature over the machine. In a way, the way that you have pro projected that piece is almost as if the tree is now the machine. I mean, with the power of the machine, but it's now in nature and not with us. Um, so, I, I, you know, there are a lot of things that you can play with. Yeah, so um, about the garden and how I was thinking I, what, what I was doing, um, I very much like that idea, Fred, that, you know, going out into the natural world and making a photograph of it is kind of a form of gardening. Uh, you're bringing, I guess, human intelligence somehow to what's happening there. And that does seem very much like a form of gardening. It wasn't at the top of my mind that I was doing it um, that way, but I like that. And I, th I think that I think of the garden, even though the Garden of Eden was supposedly um, untouched, paradise, everything was the way it needed to be. No, Fred's saying no, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> oh, they're supposed to tend it, right? Okay. Um, but. I, in Leo Marx, I think that one of the things I became aware of, more aware of is what's called the middle landscape. Um, and that's, I think, a combination of both of these things. And it seems to me that our way forward is that we have to understand how we're going to have a middle landscape that works, where you know we acknowledge the natural world and what we need to do to tend it, and we also figure out a way that we can continue to be human beings, you know, who rationalize things, try to fix things, try to be innovative. Um, that's hard, but I mean, maybe there's a way forward doing that. I wanted to say, related to Wren's, what it reminded me of, actually, I'm looking for a, a quote. You may not remember this, and I didn't bring this video in, but it's the other video that was in black and white. And it's the one where I feel, actually I felt like there was anger in it. Um, and it's the one, if you can remember this, it's another red maple, but it's not in the same place. And there was a huge wind blowing through this tree and the leaves were slapping, they were slapping the camera. Um, and it was my attempt to say something about racial injustice, even though it might not have been appropriate for me to do that. Um, and also that was where I used the Gwendolyn Brooks quote. And uh, I love this quote. Um, I think it's appropriate to a lot of what all of us were feeling. This is from a poem that's called My Dreams, My Works Must Wait Until After Hell. And she says, I hold my honey and I store my bread in little jars and cabinets of my will. I label clearly and each latch and lid I bid, B 
be firm till I return from hell. I am very hungry. I am incomplete. Um, and in a way, I think what I was doing there was trying to refer to, you know, something even beyond the pandemic, something that has been with us for far too long. So we're, we're approaching, well, we're a little after five o'clock now. The time went quickly. And I want to allow enough time for everyone to go up to the gallery to see Greg's show that has a few different bodies of work that all um, really work in dialogue with so many of the things we've talked about. But before we close, I'm wondering if there's one more film that you would like to screen. Also, um, if anybody has any more questions, and I'll promise to give really short answers. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at the list of videos that we, we prepared 12 videos. So far, we're three. <laughs> okay, well, how about one that none of you have seen before? And it's so it's so new, I have to figure out which one it is. Okay, um, Sydney, it's, um, well, it's first son, number 28, late winter field. Thank you all for coming, and please join us upstairs in the gallery. And as Greg mentioned, he's happy to answer any questions you might have about his work upstairs or the films. So 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank Jody as well, who put a lot of work into this, and Sydney, and Caroline, and Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs>